This episode is from Series 2 of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description. Well, welcome indeed to the uh, what is the last of the second series of Close Readings, which, as you all know, is a series of conversations between us about modern poets who, who wrote in English. My name is Seamus Perry. I teach English at Baydell College in Oxford, and I talk in these conversations to my friend Mark Ford, who is a poet and a critic and professor of English at University College London. And today we are doing something a little bit unusual, not just because there's a live element to the event, but also because we're talking about a particular poem rather than about a a particular poet and the uh, history of that poet. Uh, And we're talking about The Wasteland, Eliot's great poem of 1922. So I suppose the first question, Mark, would be to ask you, what is it about The Wasteland that deserves the special treatment. What is it about the wasteland that makes it quite such an influential and, you know, historic and momentous thing? Well, as many people have been saying this year, the wasteland is where modern poetry found itself and it transformed poetry and the concept of poetry altogether more than any other poem of the 20th century. Obviously, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was the first Eliot poem that made people think, hang on, the era of Swinburne and Tennyson is over, that something is happening here and we need to find out what it is. Mm. But it was the wasteland more than Proof Rock or the earlier Eliot poems, which, I mean, Eliot wasn't initially at all popular. It was the wasteland which became massively popular and influential Mm. and in all kinds of different ways as well in that it not only hit a sort of general a a general readership that started slowly but gathered pace but it became sort of central to the concept of what we do which is teach English literature (laughs) to the whole concept of the English department Mm. you could say the English departments exist partially to be able to teach the wasteland people sign up for courses because they don't understand what this poem is about even with the notes and they then get more notes I mean and and this um, uh, and this process has kind of continued in terms of making poetry. And and this it shares with Joyce's Ulysses that came out the same year, that both of them, to some extent, are texts which need explication. That doesn't mean that you can't read them and get an enormous amount out of them, but somehow, particularly the wasteland, operates or functions almost like a prophet preaching to disciples. And it puts you into the position almost of a disciple. And you think, if I'm going to understand this poem, which is the poem that sort of decodes modernity, I need to do read the same books that Eliot had read. So you read the notes, you read the books that are mentioned in the notes, uh, you read perhaps all the notes that Christopher Ricks and Jim McHugh put together in their massive edition. No and that's one, actually no the end of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you mentioned the notes. So, so the, the anniversary today isn't the first publication of the poem, is it? It's the first publication of the poem in book form in New York, published by Boney and Liveright. And that's, I believe, the first occasion on which the notes appear. Yes. Is that right? He, because, so, yeah. So what would you say, mm, w- within the whole kind of cultural impact of this extraordinary poem, what, what role do those notes play, do you think? That there's sort of there's a spoof element to them, and Eliot only wrote them because mm. Boney and Liveright said this is too short. This poem, <laughs> 433 lines. Eliot uh, Pound famously called it the longest poem in the English language. Mm. W i d g e mm. language mm. in Poundian, and it does compress a, an enormous range of kind of references and allusions and different kind of layers of literary and cultural history. But it's still only 433 lines, yeah. so it did didn't fill up, even with generous spacing, the 32-page booklet which Boney and Livewright yep. had. So they said, how about some notes? And Eliot yep. didn't really like the idea. Right. And he delayed and delayed, wouldn't do it. Eventually, he did start doing it. And there's an element of kind of spoofery going on in them, do you not think? Mm, some are quite spoofy, aren't they? Like the, the one about the, the song thrush. The hermit thrush, drip, yes. Yeah. The hermit thrush, drip, drop, drip, drop. And, and he says, you know, quotes the Latin name for the hermit thrush and says that it's, you know, it's water dripping song is justly celebrated or something, which is really, you know, 
jokey and nonsense. But what about what about the, the notes that say things like, you know, the figure of Tiresias is the central figure of the poem, and in a way, you know, organizes all the rest of the poem. And that seems like quite a directive kind of thing for a poet to say about his own poem. I, I think that is absolutely mm. crucial. That mm. note, and that that note has had more influence mm. on how the poem is read because right at the center of the poem you meet Tiresias bang in the middle of the poem uh, sort of just yeah 237 lines in I think so or, or, or 217 so it's right in the middle and Tiresias is the consciousness and the story of Tiresias is is also so important to the meanings that the poem goes on to express in that if you don't know the story of Tiresias, it was he was somebody who'd been both a man and a woman. Uh, he saw a couple of snakes copulating and he hit them with a stick uh, and he was turned into a woman. And then seven years later, the same thing happened. He hit them again with a stick. He never learned. Uh, and um, he was turned back into a man. Yeah. But the point about the story is that Jupiter and Juno then had a quarrel about who had more pleasure from sex. Yes. And they yes. got Tiresias up there. And Tiresias said that women have more fun during sex. And Juno was so angry, she made him blind, which is why he's blind. And Jupiter, in recompense, gave him the gift of prophecy. So we have this blind prophetic androgyne or transgender person in the middle of the poem yeah. who sees the whole poem and Eliot's note on that obviously links him yes. with Tiresias. Yes, he does flag it up in a very you know, significant way, doesn't it? Yes, that's absolutely right. Yes. So it's a hundred years ago that this poem appeared in the particular version that we're talking about and a little bit earlier than that otherwise. Mm -hmm. What should we say about the backstory of this poem? I mean, this is a poem that that must have seemed to loads of people when it appeared to have come from nowhere. But actually, once you look at Eliot's life, it, you can see the genealogy of it in, in, in various ways. His, his, you know, his background in Harvard classical scholarship and Sanskrit scholarship, but also his extraordinarily fraught you know, domestic arrangements in London in the years immediately before the composition of the poem. I mean, how, do, how should we... Eliot's famous for saying that poetry is impersonal, that the impersonality of the poet is the sign of genius, but at the same time, lots and lots of great scholars and critics, including people who have appeared in the LRB, have said, you know, clearly so much of this poem comes out of his personal circumstances. I mean, how, how do we get our heads around that? Well, he, he was certainly had the ideal of impersonality, mm. but the, looking back on that one thinks, pull the other one, Tom. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's extraordinary the extent to which Eliot's poetry works by activating our uh, fascination with the charismatic figure of Eliot himself, that he, like almost like a kind of master criminal of some kind, like kind of Moriarty mm. or Sherlock mm. Holmes figure, mm. seems to be weaving this extraordinary kind of narrative to which one feels there must be a clue of some kind. Um, but you get a lot of violence in the poem. Think of the corpse buried in the first part, the yeah. burial of the dead. Yeah. Has it begun to sprout? <laughs> Will yeah. it bloom this year? So there's very much a um, transfiguration of Eliot's own anxieties. And I suppose in terms of the context, there's both the sort of personal and there's the more kind of cultural context that he is an American coming over to Europe initially, to Paris and then to Germany. And then he settles or comes to England in 1914. And in that, he's in the tradition of, say, Henry James. I think Henry yeah. James was probably the most important precursor of this very, very well-educated uh, New England, though Eliot grew up in, in Missouri, in St. Louis, but he was from a New England-style family. He's a Harvard man, though. A Harvard yeah. man, yes. Yeah. He went to school at Milton Academy in um, Boston. So that he d does belong to this kind of Boston Brahmin. Yeah. And he comes to London. And in a very different way from Henry James, he does conquer London, doesn't he? And The Wasteland is a poem set in London yes. um, and embedded in London, probably the greatest London poem of the 20th century. Yeah. So uh, if we're thinking about uh, about his you know, location within English literary culture and elements like that, how do you see him sitting within the poetic scene of his day? I mean, it, uh, it feels like a revolution. But 
I mean, he's taking part in things like the TLS, isn't he, and writing for the TLS and writing for other journals at the time, participating in in that kind of literary world. I mean, he's not just, uh, you know, as it were, a Martian coming in from outside, is he? There's a sense in which he is also participating in an existing uh, English literary yeah. scene. Which and it was, through, it was through his criticism that he sort yeah. of made his name, that his early criticism... I suppose the most best known is tradition and the individual talent yeah. of 1919, yeah. a sort of astonishing essay, uh, which bears a, a great deal of, of, of relevance to the wasteland in terms of its vision of culture. That um, Eliot was very much unlike his kind of cracker barrel friend as Ezra Pound, who was really a loose cannon in all sorts of ways in London and got everyone's backs up in different ways, more or less. Eliot was much more feline, insinuated himself into these... Um, very powerful institutions, and he became kind of synonymous with institutions of literary London in Faber and Faber and Russell Square. He was known as the Pope of Russell Square. Yes. Uh, it's called by Delmore Schwartz, the literary dictator of the Western world. But London was the base. <laughs> London was the base in which yeah. he achieved this. And London, it's worth remembering, in the early years of the 20th century, was the capital of the world in various ways. We tend to think of New York or being the most important place where everything happens. But actually, particularly for Eliot and Pound, mm. and in a way which was perceived as a betrayal by fellow American poets such as Wallace Stevens and William Carlos Williams, coming to Europe was essential for their self-education, mm. for their ability to develop into great poets, great writers. Mm. They had to come to Europe because of the centuries of cultural uh, tradition, which which are obviously present in the wasteland, which goes back, April is the cruelest month, goes yeah. back to Chaucer, yeah, yeah. Uh, starts with Chaucer, yeah. and then goes on through Spencer and Dunn, and, uh, Marvell and Middleton and so on, right through to Baudelaire. And Paris is the other stop on, on that particular yeah, trail yeah. for both Pound and Eliot. So we're talking about a poem here which is quite paradoxical in a way, isn't it? Because it's clearly a very intellectual poem, a very academic poem, you might even say. So you need notes to it, or, or at least notes aren't inappropriate to it. But at the same time, as uh, Frank Commode says in a wonderful essay he writes for the London Review of Books about Eliot, there is something about the Eliot effect which is much more kind of primordial than the intellect. It's about a shudder, is the word that Commode brings out of, of Eliot's own prose, about something which is kind of sort of visceral and shocking and primordial at some level. And that also gets into the way stand, doesn't it? It's a deeply intellectual poem, but it's also a deeply kind of pre-intellectual poem. Yes, and in, in that it connects, doesn't it, with early 20th century modernism's interest mm. In, mm. in primitive art, which you can see in Picasso or in Joseph mm. Conrad's Heart of Darkness, yeah. which did furnish the original epigraph, but was replaced by something from Petronius, a, a pound's suggestion that Conrad wasn't weighty enough to stand the dedication. But that's obsession in the early decades of the 20th century with looking beneath the veneers of civilization to some kind of primitive impulse, a tom-tom, to use mm. Uh, mm. the phrase used in Portrait of a Lady, punning on his own name there, but the idea of, of drums, uh, which Eliot wanted to make use of in his play Sweeney Agonistes, to connect to this kind of primal surge of feeling. So it is dramatising the conflict between one's primordial urges and the super-sophisticated intellectual mm. atmosphere, which is rather parodied, isn't it, at the opening of A Game of Chess? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In that the, the chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble. Yes. She's a kind of figure of 90s-ish decadence, yes. who is stifling and claustrophobic and is yes. in want of some kind of energy. She's a sort of fake Cleopatra, isn't she? But also kind of a Cleopatra at the same time. Yes, yes exactly. No, yes. That, no that's, that's true. It, the intellectualism of the poem, I think, is interesting, isn't it? Because it was clearly interpreted at the time, I think, as a very, very you know, brainy, academic, intellectual poem. But Eliot himself is so interested, I mean, not necessarily in connection with this poem in particular, but... A few years later, he he says things like, "What you know? What he would ideally like was an audience that could neither read nor write. You know, he wants a kind of absolutely kind of innocent audience that would just absorb the poetry as if it was pure kind of music of 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 some nevertheless communicative kind. I mean, what, 
Well, Eliot's intellectualism is complicated, isn't it? Complicated. Uh, for one aspect of it for me is Eliot the prophet figure. Yeah. That, that the New England background of Eliot wanting to be a prophet figure, somehow to be someone who interprets the world for those who follow, that he yeah. is. A and the extent to which there's an ideal of mastery, mastery not only of the Western canon, but mastery of the audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, is somehow yeah. part of that. And Dan Jacobson makes a very interesting point in his piece in the LRB about the relationship of that mastery to degradation. He connects some of the kind of sordid, squalid aspects of the poem and some of the satirical... I mean, Eliot was a satirist. He started life, you could, might say, as a satirist. And um, there's lots of ways in which satirists say nasty things <laughs> about other mm. people. Mm. That's what Alexander Pope and, yeah. and John Dryden did. And there's some <coughs> Popean couplets, which were excluded in the end. The Fresca section, which is, says very nasty things about people. So there is a connection between nastiness and eloquence uh, in Eliot, which one can track, particularly in relation to, if you read all the drafts, uh, of the poem, but that mastery of things was obviously central to Eliot. Yeah. He needed to be in command of things. And yet, the paradox is, at the heart of the poem, is someone who has the opposite of mastery. Tiresias mm. is a kind of hysteric, you might say, mm. to use a kind of a, a term that I'm, I'm deliberately using as a gendered term, because mm. the poem also came out just after the First World War, when a lot of soldiers had shell shock. And there are some references in it to the First World War. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost yeah, their bones. Absolutely, yes, absolutely, uh, yes. So the notion of male helplessness is in, or transgender helplessness, is in dialogue with the notion of intellectual or emotional command and mastery. Yes. I think that tension is one of the central tensions. No, that's the absolutely a connection with Septimus Smith and Mrs. Dalloway or something like that, isn't it? That's true. You bring up gender. It's interesting, isn't it, that most of the portraits of people who are, as it were, representatives of the wasteland are women. Both of the people in part two of the wasteland are women. Barbara Everett and her... Uh, I really would recommend this. It's a brilliant essay that she writes for the LRB. Very long, brilliant essay where she talks about the lethal games that women play <laughs> in 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 uh, part two of the wasteland. But it's not just part two. It's also part three. Is it's about female experience, isn't it? Um, I wonder what do you think about that. What what, what what what's your sense of the role that gender plays in Eliot's sense of of the wasteland as a as a kind of spiritual predicament. Well, there's the spiritual and there's the sexual, isn't yeah, there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they are, in, again, in some kind of interesting interrelationship or tension. And a couple of the pieces of the LRB quote, the famous letter to Conrad Aiken, in which he talks about walking on the streets with his virginity and yes, yes, <laughs> wishing right. he'd got rid of it yes, um, right. before yeah. he got married. Well, he, it seems like he didn't. And uh, the marriage to Vivian is obviously the kind of, Whatever has come out about this woman called Emily Hale, whom Eliot had met when he was quite young in his teens, um, and uh, whom he says he fell in love with before coming to Europe, but he didn't realise it, and he married Vivian, and then he wished he hadn't. Whatever you say about Emily Hale, and this is what Eliot's own phrase about her, was that she would have killed the poet in me. Yeah. Vivian, he goes yeah. on, nearly killed me... <laughs> but she kept alive the poet in me. So Vivian, to an astonishing extent, was the portal through which Eliot moved into this world of complete emotional disintegration, fragmentation, mm -hmm. neurosis, craziness, use whatever term you like. And it's very interesting that Vivian writes on the manuscript against, my nerves are bad tonight, yes, bad. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, yes! <laughs> um, so... While on the one hand she was a kind of muse figure for the disintegrating consciousness, the poem in Acts, in other ways she was a collaborator in the creation of that particular way of writing poetry that, I mean, we haven't mentioned Freud and no. the id and so on at this point, <laughs> but that's what's happening as well in the century, isn't it? You know? It's later down one of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the whole, I mean, Eliot disliked Freud and the whole yeah, psychoanalytical yeah, 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 yeah. interpretation yeah, of experience. Yeah. He, he was dead against it. But there are ways you can construe it in those terms, which are quite interesting. Yes, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, there was also something quite interesting, isn't there, in, in the way that the representation of female experience is is in some ways so 
kind of exposed or so, um, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but uh, you know, there's no obvious sort of sense of sympathy about it. And I suppose what I'm picking up here is something that Barbara Everett says in one of her brilliant pieces in the LRB about Eliot, where she says that Eliot is, is not the most humane <laughs> poet in English literature. There's something rather rather brutal in a way about about or harsh or stark or something about the exposure of what was clearly their marital relationship yeah. in, in, in the second part of part two. Yes, I mean, all the women, he says they're all one women yeah. <laughs> and linked to each other and they all suffer some kind of violation of some kind. So yeah. they're linked yeah. They're linked by that. And uh, actually, in, in the, the most recent Faber edition of the manuscripts of The Wasteland, you also get, when Eliot sent all this material off to his patron, John Quinn, in New York, along with the notebook, Inventions of the March Hare. And by mistake, I'm sure, he included with the manuscript of The Wasteland the hotel bills uh, for his stay in Margate at the Albemarle Hotel in Cliftonville. Uh, and you can see from these how many baths he had and the first week he only had two, but then as obviously the poem goes better, he treats himself with a few more baths. One day he has two baths. He had to pay a shilling for each of these baths, so they're added to the bill. But it got me thinking about gender and water <laughs> in the poem and the extent to which water is very much, for, for the men, water is transfiguring those are pearls that were his eyes or elegiac, death by water or eschatological, uh, bringing rain, thunder mm. and all mm. this. Mm. And the women, water is, they wash their feet in soda water. <laughs> the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and mm. her daughter. Mm. They wash their feet in soda water. And that's actually taken from a First World War song and it wasn't feet in the original song. No. <laughs> So he's taking this bawdy song and that women wash for hygiene or for comfort, the hot water at 10. But for the men, it's all part of some enormously complicated and dignifying quest for spiritual purification. So that's just one way. The baths got me thinking about water in the wasteland. One way in which the gender divisions operate uh, can be tracked, I think, through its uh, aquatic references. So... Even today, we think of it as being a revolutionary poem, something you know that no poem had done before. Uh, how would you, both as a critic but also as a poet, how would you think about the ways in which it was doing something new? Because there were, you know, there were fragmentary poems before, weren't there? And there were poems that talked about urban experience before, and there were poems that talked about spiritual desolation before, in the 19th century especially. What, what do you think is the thing that Eliot brought to, to all that 19th century and early 20th century inheritance that he had and then made something new with it? Well, you got me on a, <laughs> one of my pet subjects here, which is the notion that American poetry is different from British poetry okay. in this respect, that all American poetry has to be revolutionary to survive, whereas in British poetry you have this gradual development of Wordsworth to Keats to Tennyson to Hardy to Larkin and so on, this evolution. Think of the American poets from the 19th century, remember. Mm. They're both completely from left field, Walt mm. Whitman mm. and Emily Dickinson. Mm. They're completely different mm. from the mainstream of American poetry. So American poetry has always, the canonical American poetry is per se revolutionary. Yeah. So it's, and, yeah. and then you think of Pound or Williams or Crane or Stevens. They're all doing something radically different. Mm. So the concept of originality in relation to American poetry is quite different. And Eliot, for all his love of London and particularly of Bloomsbury, the extent to which he managed to insinuate, um, that's, that's a slightly loaded term, he managed to become accepted in high-class circles. And that was one of his aims. A lot of his letters from this period saying, I dined with Lord this or Lady that. And he's always boasting to his parents about the high-class connections that he's making, as well as with the Bloomsbury set, Virginia Woolf and so on, yeah. that despite his becoming an Englishman and wearing, as Virginia Woolf famously put it, a four-piece <laughs> four <piece> suit, <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> uh, which captures more succinctly than anything, the kind of uh, intensity and phoniness 
of Eliot's Englishness. I mean, I used yeah, to yeah, this yeah, in, yeah. in a sort of interesting way because towards the end of his life, he said, actually, I think I might be an American poet after all yeah. that. But to go back to your question, that fusion of intense personal experience, or I mean, as you possibly know, the poem was written and that at a time when he was having a nervous breakdown. I mean, he was signed off work for having a nervous breakdown, so he wasn't using the phrase metaphorically. Mm. He called it abouli, a want of will. Mm. But he did go off to uh, Roger Vitoz in Lausanne for a rescue. And I actually looked up roughly what Roger Vitoz did. It's called a CBT, basically. Oh. <laughs> it's just basic CBT. Yes, he had to um, think of words, think of sentences, and then remove words from them. Right. Or think of number sequences and remove the numbers from those. Gosh. And that gave you control of your thought. That's a thesis. <laughs> there is a thesis there. <laughs> um, so it, it is a... Um, it wasn't that kind of... You know, he was recommended by Oth Lady Otherline Morell, wasn't he? To go and to Huxley, I think. Uh, Julian Huxley yeah. or Aldous Huxley? One of the Huxleys. One of the Huxleys, yeah, yeah. yes. I think it was Aldous Huxley. Yeah. That Vitoz was the man, the first right. great right, nerve right, right, man. Right. My nerves are bad. Nerves were the source of the problem. But this elementary CBT seemed to have done the trick. Or maybe it was being away from Vivian for three weeks. Who knows? But this but poem, she, which had been she building came, up... She came to see him, didn't she? No, she came to Margate. Oh, okay, she Margate. didn't go to Lausanne. Right, right, she right, stayed right. in Paris. Um, they went to Margate together. And she gave him a mandolin, which is why we get a mandolin in the poem yes, as well. Yes, yes. We should um, talk about Margate a little bit, shouldn't we? Yes. Because uh, it's mostly a London poem. And mostly written in London, although there are bits and pieces of it that are gathered together from a, even a Harvard manuscripts, aren't there, <laughs> that he puts into it. But then in part three, the, the last parts of part three, he's in Margate, partly with Vivian, but partly on his own. We want to read some of those because we haven't had any of Eliot's own words so far, so it seems appropriate that we should have some of them. Yes, this is the, the Rhine Maidens. These yeah. are women who have been... Um, are all, in some ways, have been seduced in some ways. I'll read the last bit of the fire sermon. Trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me, Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond I raised my knees, supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people, humble people who expect nothing. La, la. To Carthage then I came. Burning, 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 burning. O Lord, thou pluckest me out. O Lord, thou pluckest. Burning. I mean, I agree that the bits from St. Augustine at the end are particularly radical. Yeah. I mean, just the, uh, the, the ellipsis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just the removal of all the stuff, just the burning, and though, Lord, thou pluckest me out, oh, yeah. Lord, thou pluckest. Yeah, yeah. That, that, no one had done that before. No, that is new, isn't it? So in terms of the revolutionaryness, yes, technically, absolutely. that is the invention of Eliot. And uh, one of the interesting words that Pound uses on the wasteland against the good bits is echt, the German for the real thing. Yes, or the authentic. Authentic, yeah, yeah. yes. And that was what was so amazing about Pound's contributions to the manuscript, the editing of it, is he had this infallible notion or awareness of what was echt Eliot, what was the real thing, and where Eliot was either consumed by prejudice, anti-Semitic prejudice, as in Dirge and the Bleistein, a very unpleasant elegy for Bleistein, who's being eaten by lobsters, or in the bits about Fresca satirising socialite Londoners. Uh, all those bits, Pound put a blue pencil through and said, no, not echt. But the bits that are real Eliot, the echt bits. And Eliot had no notion of this, it seems, mm. that he had this vast, sprawling manuscript and he couldn't tell what was good what and what was wasn't what good. was not good, no, exactly. Do you think there's anything that Pound suggested should be cut that should not have been cut? No, he, he just had it. <laughs> the editorial, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about that this year, the editorial genius. And in that sense, the poem is a collaboration. 
Mm. Uh, it, it is a collaboration between two men. And that has inspired a lot of kind of homoerotic readings of the poem. Um, I think I, I don't quote... Think, I don't think Eliot fancied Pound at all. No, no. Um, <laughs> but Pound did write this bizarre thing, Sajom, and he's the midwife, <laughs> and the Uranian muses and all that, and it has inspired all sorts of um, notions that the collaboration was somehow a kind of, you know, um, was somehow... Um, well, it was an extreme exchange of imaginative energies, yeah, yeah, you could yeah, say. Absolutely. So to that extent, yeah, yeah. is mimetic of, of a very, very powerful, intense relationship between two people. But there was, yes, clearly no sexual element to it. Though um, there was a critic in 1956, I think it was, John Peter, who said oh, it yes. was about Jean Verdinal, about oh, yes. a young man you who died. You say something about Jean Verdinal. Well... <laughs> He was Eliot's friend in Paris in um, 1910 and 1911, and he died in Gallipoli. And Proofrock and other observations is dedicated to him, yes. more of Dardanelle. And yeah. obviously, it was a very intense relationship for Eliot. Uh, again, there's no evidence at all that it was kind of sexual no, in, in any sure way, it no. but it was extremely intense for Eliot. And it's uh, very wrapped up in Wagner and yes, Tristan and his older and, and so yeah, on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, this is what happens with the wasteland. There isn't <laughs> this mm. is a good example that we spin off into all these other art artworks. It's got an extraordinary uh, centripetal force mm. and centrifugal force mm. that it both gathers to into itself all these other texts, other seminal and not so seminal historical documents like Marie Lerich. Nobody would have read her particular no. account of going down a sleigh, uh, no, a no. sled uh, in the winter. There you feel free. None of that would have come to light had Eliot not happened to remember it and incorporated into the wasteland. So the mixture of the canonical and the completely random. Yeah. But what holds them together is the, is the centripetal imaginative energies of Eliot's own poem and Pound's in tuneness to those energies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which managed to separate uh, the wheat from the chaff. It is still, I mean, if you read the manuscript, is still one of the great marvels of the imaginative documents in, of, of the world. I, is that going too far, Seamus? Oh, uh, <laughs> Pound's contribution, you mean? The whole, or? the manuscript okay. itself, yeah, which yeah, you yeah, saw. Yeah. You yeah, saw, yeah. you've seen the real thing. I've seen the real thing in the your public library. Absolutely, yes, that's true. I mean, I would advise all of you to read part four of The Wasteland, which at the moment is a little tiny stub Death by Water, and originally it was actually quite a long narrative about a disastrous sea journey. It was a disastrous kind of nautical journey which ends in a, an, mm. a, a, a kind of sort of Titanic-like uh, iceberg wreck. And actually, there are bits of that. Pound cuts it all out and mm. thinks this is no good at all. And Eliot humbly accepts his view. But actually, there are bits of it that I think are really quite good. Yes. And as, yes. as, as yes. they're approaching the iceberg, one of the, the things that uh, Eliot imagines the crew crying out as they get closer and closer and closer to this absolutely catastrophic iceberg is, my God, man, there's bears on it. <laughs> and that was the phrase when William Empson reviewed the first version of this uh, facsimile edition that he chose for his title. I think in the LRB, actually. Yes, I yes, think that's right. right. Uh, so, you know, that was a great line. Empson spotted the great line, which had been cut. And it was just reduced to this little stub, which is about Flavus the Phoenician, who is, is drowning. And that was a, a poem originally written in French, wasn't it? Yes. Um, in 1920, so some, yes. some time before. And Eliot thought, well, should I cut that too? Yeah. And Pound writes back, no, needed absolutely where yeah, yeah, he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, Phlebas yeah, yeah. needed yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. spelled A-B-S-O-L-O-T-L-Y. Yes, exactly. Read out part four, because it's a beautiful part. Phlebas the Phoenician a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you, Yes. Well, why do you think it's needed absolutely where it is, Seamus? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, what will happen, um, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I think that Pound wanted it to be a five-part, a five-act play, in a way, yeah. didn't he, really? Yeah. So it had to be an act four. 
And the um, elegiac strand and yeah. the burial. I mean, th a lot of recent criticism has noticed how much necromancy <laughs> there yeah. is in yeah, Eliot's yeah, poetry, how much he's concerned with people who are, have died. And this is... Um, Something actually, I suppose, that links him with one of his great bugbears, Thomas Hardy, whose poetry he hated. But Hardy also could only write about dead people. Mm. <laughs> and Hardy and Eliot both had wives who uh, caused them a certain amount of uh, discomfort, put it no, more strongly than that. And I think that th to that extent, Vivian Eliot and Emma Hardy are similar in enabling these poets to achieve their greatest poetic expressiveness yeah. Uh, yeah. through their that they offer a kind of, yeah, I've used the word portal, a kind of portal through which both of them travel to, uh, uh, in, in, or they could be seen as muse figures, no muse figures who are not benign necessarily. And Vivian really wasn't benign, uh, I think, uh, or at least she was fantastically interesting though. And um, I suppose what Eliot meant when he said Emily Hale would have killed the poet in him is that she wasn't very interesting. Uh, although it has recently been suggested that Emily Hale uh, Eliot himself connected her to certain passages in the wasteland uh, in letters that he wrote to her, but he wasn't necessarily telling the truth. Or what's your take on the Emily Hale affair, Seamus? I don't, I don't know about the Emily Hale affair really. I, it seems very, you know, mysterious and hard to pin down, doesn't it? But I'm interested in something that Michael Wood says in an LRB piece, which perhaps belongs in the same kind of area of um, speculation where he says that one of the things that's quite striking about Eliot is, um, you know, and, and broadly speaking, I think Michael you know, is a huge fan of Eliot and loves him dearly uh, and admires him greatly and so forth. But but he does actually put his finger on something, I think, which is rather brilliant, where, where he talks about um, Eliot's snobbery of suffering, that there's a kind of... There's a kind of uh, element within Eliot's imagination that thinks having a really awful time somehow puts you into the elite or somehow puts you into a certain kind of emotional or sort of psychological aristocracy that, you know, most people, you, you know, who are wandering around the world aren't admitted to because somehow your suffering buys you admittance to that world. What do you think about that? Well, there's that letter to Middleton Murray about yeah. the stony places. He yeah. writes the, uh, and Murray writes to him saying, you know, he refers to stony places and Eliot writes back, you don't know anything about stony places. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who, who suffers in the stony places. Mm. Um, Murray's just trying to compliment him by making a reference to a bit of the wasteland and he will have none of it. So certainly, and the famous bit in tradition, the individual talent, that only those who want to escape feelings, <laughs> yes, yes, who yes, have yes. feelings, know what it's like to want to escape them. Yeah, so that somehow, yeah. always there is this personal pressure on Eliot. And I think we're just skirting round what is a poem that has generated shelves and shelves of books. Mm. And the mania to interpret it is a tribute to something going on in it. <laughs> something is happening. We may not know exactly what it is, to quote Bob Dylan, but somehow something is happening. And that generates new waves of readings. And so from almost from the 30s, there was lots of very solemn hunting for grail imagery right. on the basis of the notes. Of the notes. Yeah, the yeah. notes. Everyone was reading their Jesse Weston and their Golden Bough by Fraser and yes. Anthropology yes, yes. and in taking it terribly seriously Which on those I think terms. We, would rock, we would not recommend, I think, uh, on the whole. Um, <laughs> uh, no. No. <laughs> I mean, Jesse Weston. I, Jesse Weston is a waste of an afternoon, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what is interesting in terms of, again, your question, what's revolutionary, is this the mixture of references, these allusions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, w yeah. which are the yeah. shudders, to use Commode's term. So all the last extraordinary passage has been called by one critic, Eliot, at his most confessional. None of it is actually by him. Uh, he's borrowed the lines from other people. Poesas goza nel foco keli afina, quando fiam cu kelidon, o swallow, swallow, le prince d'Aquitaine a la tour aboli. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. That's him. That's Eliot. Yeah. It's the only line that's Eliot. Yeah. Uh, why then I'll fit you, Spanish tragedy. Hieronimo's mad again. Data diadvam damiata. 
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Uh, one line, and yet this is pure Eliot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Eliot yeah, yeah, had his yeah. most confessional, it's at his brilliant. most personal. It's an astonishing feat to have been, well, mature poet Steele was the phrase that he used for what he was able to do. And reading for him was an experience. Other yeah. people have experiences you know, in life. <laughs> But for Eliot, reading, and I think there's no similar, the only one I can think of it similar is Milton in that sense. And to which yeah, no, that's right. The, the, yes. the accumulation Who of scholarship. Of course, Eliot despised. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or he changed his mind a bit a later. A bit, yes. but not much. Uh, no, that's true. Uh, so one of the reasons that we're talking about it 100 years on and has come up so much this year is the extent to which it's able to generate new interpretations, new kind of ways of reading it, responding to it. Like you, I teach it year in, year yeah. out, and my yeah, students yeah. are always, wow. I know. That's it's amazing. True. It is true. Uh, and I say, yes, it is good. It is, <laughs> it is, it is, it is perennially new. Yeah. yeah. It's an extraordinary thing in that respect. And but that line, you know, mm. these fragments I have shored against my ruins, it's such a fantastic line, isn't it? Because you don't know if it's emphasizing the, the shoring so that something has been saved or something has been somehow kind of redeemed or mitigated, or whether it's actually emphasizing the ruins that, you know, I've done the best I can, but I'm still in a condition of ruin. Mm. So it absolutely captures, doesn't it, the structure of the poem. You don't know if the poem is a cohesive, you know, achieved unity or whether it's just a bunch of stuff that absolutely. doesn't really add up. And because of the later Christian conversion and all the later Eliot, we tend to read it as a kind of purgatorio poem. Uh, yeah. But there's actually nothing in the text to suggest that, that it's a Christian poem. Nothing remotely. Um, and he told Stephen Spender later in life that when he wrote it, he was thinking about becoming a Buddhist. Oh. So there's, there's a real, you know, there's yeah. absolutely no doctrinal kind of certainty about this poem at all. And that line that you bring out, I think, absolutely captures that kind of radical kind of ambiguity about whether this is the thing or just a, a process that hasn't really come to it. And there's just so many trails that you can yeah, follow. Absolutely. And it's just trail yeah. after trail. And it can lead you a long way from the poem. And, and some of the uh, the LRB pieces, uh, there's a couple that, that I wrote that are about, one, one's about the queer theory on the poem. Yeah, and it's just, you think, well, wow. <laughs> I'm amazed that, that Eliot can generate, can be in the queer pantheon without, on the evidence that there is, but it, it is incredibly suggestive in all kinds of different directions. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, the, the, there's um, a paragraph from an essay by Randall Jarrell of 1962, which captures, I think, I mean, there's criticism that you can read till the cows come home. And Jarrell says, what's all that about? I'll, I'll, I'll read yes. it, if, if I may. Let's finish with this. Yes. This, this would be a very good way to finish. And take some questions afterwards. Um, Jarrell writes in 1962, he's summing up lots of American poetry. And he talks about Eliot. Won't the future say to us in helpless astonishment, but did you actually believe that all those things about objective correlatives, classicism, the tradition applied to his poetry? Surely you must have seen that he was one of the most subjective and demonic poets who ever lived, the victim and helpless beneficiary of his own inexorable compulsions, obsessions. From a psychoanalytical point of view, he was far and away the most interesting poet of your century. But for you, of course, after the first few years, his poetry existed under sea, thousands of feet below that deluge of exegesis, explication, source listing, scholarship and criticism that overwhelmed it. And yet how bravely and personally, it survived. Its eyes, neither coral nor mother of pearl, but plainly human, full of human anguish. Mm. Yes, very good. Very good. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. And we have a little time for questions, if anyone has any. I've got some from the World Wide Web to kick you <laughs> off. <laughs> um, you mentioned Vivian, his wife's role. As what you term his muse, is it not the case that she would enact or perform or make vivid overheard conversations in different voices, which he was able to draw on? Did this vivid use of Argo free him in his own use of rhythm and energy? She was a good mimic, wasn't she? I mean, I think I, I think that's true. Yes, um, and she she had a quite savage wit as well. Um, and um, 
it was yes, Virginia Woolf called her um, a bag of ferrets, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not that. entirely complimentary. <laughs> um, so you didn't didn't want to be clawed by Vivian. Um, uh, but I think yes, to, to the extent that she, the pub conversation, she rewrote bits of uh, the pub conversation, which was based on their Ellen Kelland, who was there. What would you want to get married for if you don't want children? Yes, that was her line, wasn't it? That was she her line. Contributed to that line. Yeah, yes, exactly. uh, there's quite a, f a, a few lines. So she did have an ear for speech, and they obviously shared their jokes together. They shared observations of different people together. So th there was a collaborative aspect of their relationship, which you must think is, is you don't get many characters in the post-Vivian poems like Four Quartets. There are no people in Four no, Quartets. No, that's true. That's whereas true. the early Eliot poet stuff is full of people, often satirically or, or disparagingly presented, but people nevertheless. I think they were very fond of each other, mm. but I think it just all went wrong. But and I she mean, was ill. Yeah, she was ill yeah, the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and if she wasn't ill, he was ill. He was, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wondered about the, in terms of language, in the four quartets, in, I think it's Bernd Norton, he, he talks about the limits of language mm. and, not, and kind of grasping for the right words. You've talked a lot about how he, in the wasteland, you know, that, the bunch of stuff in terms of him talking in so many different kinds of voices and languages. Is he still grasping for the right words in the wasteland? Uh, yes. Um, I think his own censor, his own inner censor is a really interesting one. If I could speak as a poet in relation to this, when you're writing something and it doesn't work or you cross it out, it, it's just not, it's not ect. <laughs> So every poet has their own ect sensor going on in their heads and it changes over time. So what works for you when you're 20 doesn't work for you in your 40s or 50s or 60s. And by four quartets, it had changed a great deal. And there's a kind of meta poetry going on there, the discussion of poetry itself as a concept. And it's a, I, I mean, I love four quartets. It's a much more, it seems a kind of rather grave and grand poem, but a lot more turbulence is going on underneath it than one initially notices. That turbulence is foregrounded in the wasteland. So the bit I read about Carthage, burning, pluckist, I mean, it's really at juxtapositions, jangling, it's all over the place in terms of the electric, the, the, the electricity of the, of the words is something which isn't buried within syntax. So syntax is a way of kind of controlling or managing that, those, those energies. So to that extent, the wasteland, and Eliot felt this about the poem himself, he didn't quite know how he'd written it. And he used to say, he said to Ford Maddox, Ford, there are only 30 good lines in it, see That's if you right. can find them. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Um, and and he couldn't. He couldn't. He said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, Eliot thought the bits he wrote when he was in Lausanne with, with Roger Vitoz were a bit about the hermit thrush and the water and no water were the only good bits. Um, uh, slightly um, just baffling. <laughs> just, a, just a baffling observation, really. Um, so when you get the poem itself, I mean, there's lots... The, the interesting of thing about the drafts is there's lots of bits that are no good or don't work or that are right not to be there. Uh, it's right that Pound cut them out. And that is very, very uplifting for other poets who read the manuscripts thinking, wow, he didn't get it right first time. Why should I? So I think to that sense, it's very instructive and interesting to look at how the right words and there are passages where he just can't quite get it. And you see him reworking and reworking and, until it arrives. He's also uh, obviously to say he's a very intellectual poet, but he also thinks that poetry comes from some place in your mind which is primitive. He says that in loads and loads of places, that there's something you know, pre-civilised about the place where poetry comes from. Uh, and he talks in the, in the 1933 lectures he gives at Harvard about the origins of poetry, you know, so he's talking to about the most urbane, <laughs> educated audience he could possibly be talking to. And he says, I think that poetry probably starts with a savage beating a tom-tom in the jungle. You know, and he's talking to you know, a group of all, you know, Harvard academics and, and, and students. And so there is a real tension, isn't there, in a way, between the conscious mind and mm. the way that that works in Elliot and the fact that it all comes from some place that you have absolutely no control over at all. Mm. Um, and he, he thought of meaning, he compared to the bit of meat that a burglar yeah. brings yes, along right. to keep the dog, the, the, the watchdog 
quiet while you burgle the house. So, uh, and, and what is also interesting about Eliot for the poems is that they build up for him over a period. That it, it's like a feeling that's growing and growing. I've got to get something off my chest. And it grows and grows. He doesn't write anything. And then suddenly it comes out. And he will write the whole of Sweeney Agonistes mm. in a couple of nights. Yeah, yeah. He famously he boasts about writing The Journey of the Magi, 45 minutes between yeah, church yeah. and yeah. lunch with the yeah, aid yeah, of, yeah. of a bottle of Booth's gin. <laughs> Uh, so somehow the, the poem is is, yeah. is building and building and building in some subliminal way, and then it bursts out on the page when the inhibitions have been released in some way, and then the inhibitions come back. He talks about this in the use of poetry and the use of criticism. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. So um, it, is, yes. it, it is a fascinating, uh, and I don't know how many other poets experience things like that. I mean, I know Seamus Heaney doesn't, for instance, nope, just nope. or, or nope. John Ashbery, oh, or, or not you know. Jeffrey Hill, no, nope. no, nope. Larkin possibly. Do you? Maybe. I think, I think Larkin sat down and thought he yeah. wanted to write a poem yeah. about a train journey. Yeah. And he would have a go and have a go work it. it out. And it was difficult, but he did. It's, it. it's true. There's, that's the mystical aspect of Eliot. It's not just mysticism no, in the full text, but the mystical absolutely. notion of poetry right. as a visitation, right. as like grace in absolutely some ways. Absolutely right. And that's why Hughes revered mm. Eliot, I yeah. think, because he tweaked into this fact that for all the extraordinarily kind of, you know, academic and esoteric knowledge that goes into an Eliot poem, where it actually came from was something very kind of mm. primeval and, and, and primitive, which obviously Hughes, mm. you know, valorized in a, in a huge way. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, I do, of course, want to read The Wasteland in order to get some overall sense or even, dare I say, meaning from it. But listening to what you've been saying, I've... I almost despair in the sense that there seems to be so many possible meanings or interpretations or so much depth that if I did read, I have read it a few times, but if I did study it, I wouldn't in fact get any overall sense from, from the wasteland. Uh, I, I get lots of interesting sort of intellectual puzzles, but no overall sense. I mean, am I wrong? Do you get any overall sense of what the wasteland is getting at, or meaning, or or suggesting. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are sort of ways in which people responded to it as an a, a, as a diagnosis of the collapse of civilization and the way it connected to the cultural uh, disaffection of the times. And Eliot didn't like those readings of it necessarily, but that was how. It so I think what's interesting is the different ways in which layers or generations have interpreted it in relation to their own anxieties or problems. So I don't think there's a single meaning in Hamlet, for instance, either, uh, or King Lear. Uh, I think most great literature is a proliferation of different possible readings or meanings and tensions or anxieties, and all of them are operative or, or happening at the same time. But I think in the case of Eliot, it is interesting. And on the one hand, there is this strand of him which does seem to think that he could be a prophetic figure who could decode modernity. But the solution that he comes up with in terms of meaning, in terms of his overall career, is one based on the Anglican Church and kind of you know, Anglo-Catholicism. So religion becomes the overall meaning. And so if you pressed him he, in relation to this particular question, then overall he denounces very often in, the, in writings from the 30s onwards secularism. Secularism is evil. It's the devil. Liberalism. <laughs> liberalism. They're all yes. ba they're bad. Poison really terrible liberalism. Things. Yes. And that's where Eliot and Pound were so mm. extraordinarily different. There's a famous occasion they met in Verona, and Eliot says, "I think I'm going to hell," and Pound says, "I just don't get it. <laughs> just don't get it. <laughs> what are you on about?" But Eliot and Eliot writes to his mother saying, "It's okay. I'll see you again in heaven." You know. We'll both end up in heaven and I'll see you there. Uh, so his faith, uh, his religious faith, was was his way of interpreting the world um, to um, a great degree. Yeah. Inter so you can read The Wasteland in relation to that if you are very keen to fit it in to the Dantescan scenario of the early poems of the Inferno, Wasteland is Purgatorio, Four Quartets are Paradiso. That's a kind of Dantescan structure that can be imposed on Eliot's development, though it leaves out an awful lot, I would say. David asks, keeping things psychological, 
If Elliot needed Pound to uncover the authentic poem <coughs> poetry, does the wasteland become a piece of almost automatic writing? Maybe ties in with his description of an ideal audience. Not a poem for the mind, but for or from the subconscious. Well, he did describe the wasteland. Uh, that He wrote it when he didn't really care what he was writing. That, and that was a sort of throwaway remark that, to an extent, automatic, you know, sh sh with automatic hand, the word phrase automatic hand occurs in the typist episode and the notion of the automatic certainly that was his experience of when the muse visited, when his mm. inspiration was flowing, there was a kind of automatic aspect to it, that these things have been building up and building up. And when uh, finally they, the dam burst, there was a sense in which um, it emerged from him. Um, but I wouldn't call it, he wasn't interested in surrealism in the sense that he wasn't interested in André Breton, Philippe Soupeau's experiments in automatic writing. He thought that sort of created nonsense. So it wasn't particularly... So his automatic is actually a transcription or transfiguration of subconscious patterns or... A mu music, really, is, is the phrase one might think <coughs> of, that the, poet, the music <coughs> suddenly emerges um, and... Um, Seamus, anything? No, I think you're right about music. So I mean, he talks about the auditory imagination, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And says that in a way what drives poetry is is the auditory imagination, which is to say that you, you create lines that have a particular kind of especially compelling music. And then I suppose once you've done that, you can stand back and look at them and think, oh, goodness, that contains some meaning as well. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of... I, th I think that's the implication of those remarks about the auditory imagination, don't you? That, yes. And, and it's driven by, by something which is pre-verbal or pre-conceptual. But then once you've done it, then you realise that there is something conceptual that, that's contained within those, those lines that you've created. I'm currently <coughs> translating Jules Laforgue, as I mentioned. Ah, what a coincidence. Yes. <laughs> but Laforgue... Uh, absolutely has that and that's okay. Eliot's yeah, yeah, attraction yeah. to him okay that right. that okay. particularly good. in the dernier ver the last poems that that musical sort of flow they're like a slalom you yeah, imagine yeah, a skier yeah. on a slalom yeah, yeah, yeah. going round and round i think that's how it was for Eliot. once it started he was like a skier <laughs> going round on a slalom and that he got addicted to from reading la forgue okay. in his early that's 20s that that's okay. my okay. that's what comes to me when i'm translating la forgue i get the, the sense of how he incarnated for Eliot this musical compulsiveness repetition and the kind of inner rhymes going on which has its own momentum yeah. To which he, he so the agency is partly abandoned when that's happening. Yes. Uh, and yes. the mastery comes later, or is it's kind of um, that again the passive active in some kind of perfect balance with each other. Uh, um, I just wanted to hark back to this contrast between Eliot, the academic poet, and Eliot, the visceral poet. Let's say, um, and I was just I. I was thinking about what you said at the beginning about the notes that they were added later on. Um, so is Eliot in a way shaping our perception to read him as an academic poet with the addition of those notes? And then also, is it almost like he's wearing two hats, giving his own exegesis? and? does that inspire the wider world to also um, sort of attribute um, a need for exegesis um, and like an additional need um, for exegesis to those poems? And maybe also um, in connection to that, um, what you said about the wasteland acting as a centripetal force um, again, um, by now, it would almost do that through its canonic canonical status. But if we sort of look back at its historical context, is there something specific within the way that the poem is set up or fashioned that has that set repeatal force uh, that imbues it with it? And uh, maybe uh, just a last thing. Um, <laughs> sorry, <Not> more. <laughs> uh, very, uh, very, um, very briefly. Just um, the element of collage. Um, 
if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, start with the collage. Yes, that's the great invention. That is the great invention of the, mo of, of the modernists, of, mm. of Elliot and Pound, collage. You, you said it in one. We didn't, how come we didn't say that, Seamus? I don't know. We didn't mention I, it. I, I blame um, you. It is a collage, and collage becomes the 20th century mode, and it is the primary sort of creation of collage, and all the different pictures, he do the police in different voices, all the different collaged pictures come together, uh, and that juxtaposition become, is the central ideal of imagism, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough, to take the most famous example by Ezra Pound, that juxtaposition, movement from one to another realm, that is how collage functions. Um, the, the, the notes certainly give it this kind of spoof scholarship and suggest that there's something much more <coughs> planned and orderly and determined and preconceived about it than there was. Um, and Eliot did actually love playing games. He, he was a, a jester. I don't know if his wit has come over in our discussion of the I wasteland, no, but it is no. very funny. The poem is very funny. And Eliot's wit um, and his kind of love of practical jokes. He loved Groucho Marx. Um, he used to, he enjoyed pranks, which are not that funny to us, but on his Faber colleagues, didn't he? He was always um, known as a joker. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the notion of the practical joker, you get it in Cats more perhaps, but also in Sweeney Agonistes is, is, is the practical joke but sort of spins out of control in various ways in that play. So uh, I think he did enjoy these different roles and spoofing people and it connects to the notion of meaning that we believe and also it, uh, that we believe we understand things or meanings when we don't. Part of what a satirist does is undercut people's assumptions. So Eliot undercuts people's assumptions and he likes puncturing people's illusions. Um, uh, and that is one of the functions of a satirist, which is then in contrast with the lyrical aspects of the poetry, like the Hyacinth Girl episode, for instance. So in terms of collage, it enables him to have all these different genres interacting with each other and one not winning out over the other ones. They're in a kind of a fruitful tension with each other. And that possibly, again, is one of the revolutionary aspects of the poem, that its structure, to go back to your, your question, allows these different elements and different genres, different registers, different tones, different characters, all to be within this cosmopolitan, polyglot um, uh, 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 setting and to, to coexist with each other. Uh, so that is revolutionary and inspiring and liberating as well. Yes, I completely agree with that. At the same time, there's a negative case to be made about it, which is that the collage means that you actually have just bits of discourse that sit next to each other and never actually engage with each other. And so you you could say that there was something extraordinarily you know non-discursive about this way of writing. And William Empson, for example, uh, thought that the the imagistic way of writing, which is what he thought The Wasteland was the masterpiece of, was actually a way of making you be very stupid because you you weren't actually engaged as you were if you read an 18th century poem by Dryden or Pope or something like that in some kind of argumentative... I mean, there's no argument to The Wasteland. I, I don't mind this, but you know, there is an argument against the method that would say that this is just a way of of offering us kinds of literature that do not involve themselves in the kinds of argumentative language or discourse that might actually make us think more about ourselves or our lives or our society or something like that. Yeah. But just to go back finally to your point about the critic and the poet, they're sort of distinctive aspects of Eliot's, Eliot's consciousness. Yeah, that in his, right. he, There's his criticism... And there's his poetry. And there's a fascinating dialogue between them, which we can't and, unpack and here, but it, it, that's what's going on. And, it, and, and Terry Eagleton actually has a wonderful piece in the LRB <laughs> about the fact, partly about the fact that, you know, Eliot as a poet is so completely and utterly different from Eliot as a prose writer. Eliot as a prose writer values all those Burkean things like tradition and continuity and rationality and, you know, all those sorts of things. Eliot as a poet seems to have a wholly different set of values which uh, inspires and, and constitutes what lies behind something as brilliantly fragmentary but also kind of like sort of continuously fragmentary as the, as the wasteland. <laughs>
But, you know, nothing that the prose writer, Eliot, you'd think would ever, mm. ever have approved of. <laughs> OK. Oh, was that a... No, that wasn't a... It one was, more. OK, one, one more. more at the back. Why not? Hiya. Um, I just wanted to ask, so obviously we're talking about um, the wasteland now because it's centenary, but um, you've spoken about it tonight as a poem that kind of speaks to the time that it's read in and the sort of anxieties of its readers throughout history. And I just wondered, you know, as well as it being a kind of centenary, what you think it speaks to now? Because, um, you know, I feel that you still read bits of it and go, you know. Well, you're a young person. Tell us, how, 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 how do you... How do you experience it? Uh, I, oh my God, I feel well on the spot. But I, I read it when I was like, I read it when I was a teenager and when I, I didn't have a lot of literature in, in my life at all. And I didn't understand it at all. But was really, I, I mean, not that I do now, but, you know, I, I really didn't then. But it, it I, I, that, oh, it feels like such a cop out, but that like visceral thing, mm. you, 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 you read it and get it. You know, and there are bits of it, there are kind of lines of it that come to you, not always in the best times, right? You know, where you sort of think, oh, my God. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think there are, I mean, ch charisma is one of the things that Eliot yeah, has, yeah. That the yeah, charisma, yeah, yeah. the magnetism. He's a, he's a kind of star in that sense, and there's a charismatic element to it. But in terms of now, I just went to a symposium last week on eco the way stands is an eco poem, you know, the river sweats, oil and tar. So reading of the poem in terms of the Anthropocene. Uh, so when, when we were talking earlier uh, in relation to an earlier question about the ways in which it can be interpreted, what is astonishing about the poem is it how it, as is true of, of Hamlet or King Lear, to use the examples I mentioned earlier, it does. There is stuff in there which can be appropriated or made use of in relation to current concerns like climate change. So. Um, uh, to that extent, like great, uh, you know, th that's what what canonical writing is has that non-canonical writing tends not to have is the ability to be meaningful to new generations of readers uh, over the centuries. And we had one century of the wasteland, and it's doing pretty well. I mean, there was a huge dip when Anthony Julius's book on Eliot and anti-Semitism came out, and lots of attacks on Eliot's. Uh, for his prejudice, um, and so that was an interesting kind of passage in his in in uh, in his critical reception, and is is obviously a live issue still in many ways today in relation to kind of tribal affiliations uh, and so on. So critics are resourceful beings, as are readers, and they will make of of text what they want. Uh, often ingenious, sometimes unconvincing, sometimes. Uh, um, convincing and um, illuminating, uh, but that is what connects great the, the writing that makes up the canonical. Its ability to to, to be uh, interpreted in various ways to to, to, to new uh, eras. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I also, I mean, I remember. So I first read it as an A-level student when I was doing A-levels in physics, chemistry and biology. So I wasn't really a proper English student. And I read it because I had friends who were doing English and uh, they told me I should read it. And the two things that really stuck in my mind, I remember, were that wonderful line where he says, trams and dusty trees. You think, what an amazing line. You know, if that was in any other less famous poem, that would be a famous line of poetry. It's so beautiful. Trams and dusty trees. And then also at the end of part two, uh, you know, where it's good night, Lou, good night, May, good night, Will, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night, good night. I thought, what well, amazing, absolutely extraordinary piece of, you know, poetry and allusion and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, these these. You know, the bigger question didn't really occur to me. It was just about the local, you know, the local brilliance. I mean, Eliot's locally so brilliant. And then, you know, it's up to, you know, people like Mark or me in more ambitious moments to think about the structures in which these brilliant moments have a place. But uh, I think, you know, even more than Wordsworth, I mean, he's such a brilliant poet of the local effect. He's just dazzling, I think. Thank you very much, James. Thank you, Mark. OK. Thank you, audience. This episode is from Series 2 of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry.
To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.